So good evening, everyone. Thank you for your time. My name is Pranav and I'm one of the partners at 314. What I'll be doing is walking you through how we see the entire landscape of India changing with startups, uh, what we've identified as some of the opportunities. And uh, if we are a little bit generous and we project, uh, what is a possible change we could see over the next five to 10 years? Very quickly, uh, uh, and this is now very well known globally, but COVID-19 has exposed even the most established industries to the chasms in their assumptions. And one, one inevitable fact and takeaway from all this is that tech-driven resilience has proven to be the most future-ready mode to own. In simpler words, uh, a lot of the fundamental assumptions you would make about a business anywhere in the world, from airlines to travel, to hospitality, to manufacturing, to payments, to banking, to accounting, every aspect of your company's life cycle, uh, we are now seeing that COVID literally had to ask everyone to adapt or perish. And uh, very clearly the winner from all this has been companies that have adopted tech or are tech driven themselves and uh, are able to make that leap. If they're not able to make that leap, they get left behind. And the market is very clear when it votes, what is a future ready company to own a future ready stock and what isn't. And of course, when COVID hit, the whole world had many different responses, but there was one response in common, any country you went to, which is everyone printed money. And when you print money, one thing is inevitable. The global stimulus was more than $20 trillion. And just put that in, in, in perspective, India's GDP is now just under 3 trillion. So almost seven times India's GDP was printed as global total stimulus. And the stimulus has not stopped. I believe it continues. I think it's crossed 25 trillion now. This deck was uh, updated around three, three, four months back. Uh, so stimulus is not stopping. And uh, very clearly now with so much liquidity in the world, eventually it will come into markets. And when I say markets, what? Markets either buy a stock with the assumption that the future price will increase or they will short a stock, which means they assume the price is going to decrease from there. So what happened when we look at stock prices, right? Again, this is something, this is a story all of us very clearly saw in real time happen all over the world. But just to put one industry in perspective, all the airlines lost incredible value. While teleconferencing or you know, web calling, video calling, the prototypical stocks like Zoom saw record stock performance, right? So we saw very clearly new industries come up to substitute the legacy. And we can go sector by sector and, and prove this, but one inevitable truth from all of that is all the companies globally that are tech first monopolies. And we use these words very, very carefully, tech first and monopolies, because they are absolutely the largest companies in their space. There is no bigger e-commerce retailer in the world than Amazon. There is no bigger search company than Google. There is no bigger, more profitable device company than Apple, right? And so on and so forth. All of them saw record stock growth and a, a type of stock growth that even when things were bad, of course, they, their stocks collapsed for some time. But once recovery started, the a kind of curve that they followed for the recovery was never predictable before we saw it actually happening in real time. So what we saw across the world is a K-shaped recovery. When markets vote, vote with their dollars for or against, very clearly what is for, what is against, you start seeing that divergence. And very clearly the stocks that were in favor are the industries that were poised to recover faster, technology, retail, software services. And all the companies that didn't make it, that started getting shorted, were all the legacy industries, travel, entertainment, hospitality, food service. So inevitably, while we will see a correction, eventually the airlines will come back, obviously, this will not last forever. But this should be an important case study for all of us to understand why technology is going to be an inevitable part of every industry going forward. It's no longer a debate. It's no longer a, when will it happen? Will it happen? It's happening right now. And very clearly it's going to accelerate its importance going forward. So digitization has truly transformed the world. We have 7.8 billion people in the world, 5.2 billion people own mobile phones, almost 5 billion people are on the internet. And of them, of them 4.2 billion are on social media. And because we have now billions of people and so a majority of the people in the world are going digital, when you look at the evolution of the biggest value creators, public listed companies, the stock prices, from 1917 to 2021, just over 100 years, you've seen the entire composition of the stock market change radically. In 1917, you had companies like steel, telegraph, oil, steel, um, arms, 
you know, this is an agricultural food processing company. In 1967, you saw the first technology company. In 2017, the five most valuable oil tech companies, but you still have oil, banks, insurance, so on and so forth. In 2021, they are all replaced. And this is scary because even 2017, all of us will remember four years back that, you know, people were still saying, yeah, tech is okay, tech is fine, but cement, steel, banking, F FMCG, the importance of those companies as large pillars of the economy was not debatable. But in 2021, something remarkable has happened. And we are only seeing this accelerate. Now, this is a US stock market. If I made a similar diagram for India, this is, we are still around here somewhere, right? Now we have TCS, Reliance, Infosys, HDFC Bank are all in the top 10 as the market caps. But Zomato, Swiggy, Reliance Geo as a spin out subsidiary, TCS, Infosys. Will anyone bet today that these are not going to be the most valuable companies going forward? And some of the retail companies or banks and so on will get left behind. It's a hard bet to take. But very clearly, the US is showing us what a tech enabled future looks like for value creation. Now, what are these tech companies doing that is different? And why do we use the word tech first global monopolies? Every one of these tech companies started as business model X, but today they have seven, 10, sometimes 20 different business models in the same company. Apple is not just the world's most profitable device maker. It is now issuing credit cards. It is now automating your home. It is now one of the world's most popular music platforms. Google is now not even called Google, it's called Alphabet. And Google is not a search company anymore. It is building self-driving cars. It is building a company that will extend your lifespan with biotechnology. It is building a cellular network like Google, like uh, Lines Geo. It is building its own network called Google Fee. And Amazon, of course, we all know Amazon does everything from selling you clothes and books to now automating your personal assistant, automating your offline buying experience. They are an e-commerce company, but they are starting offline stores. And now Amazon wants to be able to allow Amazon products into your house by automating your home security as well. So these companies are not just single business model companies. We must understand and fully embrace the idea that these are all expansionist monopolies. And now there are not just American companies of this type. There are now dozens of Chinese companies aiming to be like that. So this is a global stage for innovation, for disruption and the decade from 2021 to 2030 is going to be a decade unlike anything we have seen before. And that's why now that we come to India, India is not far removed from all of this change happening in the rest of the world. India is also being digitized extremely rapidly. We have 1.39 billion people in India, but only 35% are in urban centers. But we have a billion people owning phone connections. We have almost 700 million internet users now. And we have close to 500 million people, half a billion people on social media. Unbelievable transformation. When we launched 314, all these numbers were one tenth, 10% 10 of what we are seeing here today on digital. And this wave of digitization is powered by the internet. Every second person in India now has internet. Data usage, now Indians on average are using 14.6 GB per person per month, the highest data utilization in anywhere in the world. If you look here, for example, India is able to use so much data because data is the cheapest in India now. The US is the most expensive on data price per GB that they pay. So an incredible transformation has happened and this internet growth is not happening only for the rich, only for the top 1% of India. It's happening for the entire country because it's affordable, because it's democratized, because it's accessible. So India is setting a new example for how digitization can lift all boats, not just for the wealthy, not just for the tech companies only. And how does India fare against developed nations and other emerging countries? India, if you look at all the parameters, internet users, the time spent, the ride hailing, smart home, digital payments, India is amongst the top countries in the world now by volumes. In fact, India now accounts for close to 10% of global app downloads, which is tremendous. And we are seeing this kind of digitization touch every aspect of life. We are seeing a rise in the number of first time online shoppers in India. We are seeing a rise in how much money they come back and spend, the retention spend, also growing very rapidly. And all this is led by Indian, regular Indians embracing technology. It's not government telling us to use it necessarily. It's not 
some companies marketing and making use of it. it is people are self adopting and this shows that the aspiration of the indian citizen today is all of us want a better life a better livelihood and all of us are convinced that technology is going to be one of the most important steps to take towards a better lifestyle and that's why when you look at startups in india who are building these very important companies these platforms these business models they are going to be an inevitably large part of the drive that will take india towards being a truly a 10 trillion dollar economy globally this is an important statement because where are we as a country in 1991 when we finally liberalized india was a 250 billion dollar economy uh, just to put that in perspective today reliance's share market cap is half of our gdp in 1991 that's how small we were apple today is valued at two and a half trillion dollars apple is today valued 10 times of what india's gdp was in 1991 just putting in perspective really how much of an opportunity that we have grown into from 91 today we are a three trillion dollar economy we've gone from two and a half trillion to three trillion in 30 years compounding at a 7.5 percent per annum consistently for 30 years and this is truly radical transformation everyone in the world did not believe india can do it but we have and we must celebrate this fact from two and a half 250 billion to three trillion is a big big 10x growth but now we have to go from three to ten and that's a different challenge we need different tools we need different strategy we need different policy to take us from three to ten because now it's not about can we do it it's about we must do it faster and we must do it for all indians not just for the top 100 million 200 million indians that's why startups when you look at the ecosystem in india we are now the third largest startup ecosystem in the world we are behind only the us and china today so when you rank the world's economies, we have the US at number one at plus $23 trillion GDP, China at number two, around 17 trillion. And then everything is below five, Japan, Germany, and then you have India. We have beaten France, we have beaten UK, we have beaten Israel, we have beaten Singapore, uh, we have beaten South Korea, Indonesia, we've beaten all the countries. Now we only have four countries ahead of us, Germany, Japan, China, US. But from a startup ecosystem perspective, we have already beaten these two, and we are now very, very clearly number three. We have third largest startup count of unicorns. We have the third largest amount of funding coming into Indian startups. So really, we're only behind two countries now, which is a tremendous achievement. And the Indian startup ecosystem, you can argue, is only 10, 15 years old. So it didn't even have 30 years to compound like the Indian economy had. So this is a truly radical achievement and we must celebrate the fact that Indian innovation and Indian entrepreneurs, Indian founders, Indian operators, Indian employees, Indian technologists, Indian engineers have all contributed to building this very valuable economy. There are 60,000 plus startups in India now and they have created $400 billion of value already. This is more than 10% of the GDP today, which is tremendous because if your startup ecosystems values already 10% of your GDP, it means it is an important systemic large part of now the wealth creation in the country. And now, of course, we have to diagnose how startups became valuable in India. They didn't come out of nowhere. In fact, every startup founder will tell you today that the whole ecosystem is built on the shoulders of these IT companies. And in 1989, when these companies were taking off, there was no technology policy for India. India was written off by the world. We were a poor economy. We had failed policy. We had obviously broken markets. So everyone knows the economic history of India before 1991. But these companies truly from 1989 till 2015 have built the single most profitable IT industry anywhere in the world, except the US. If there are, if you rank the top 10 IT com companies in the world, out of the top 10, five are Indian. Look at the top five IT companies in the top five, three are Indian. Today, TCS is the most valuable IT company in the world. So it's really an extraordinary achievement what IT has done for India. They are now $225 billion in revenue, $170 billion of exports. And they employ 5 million people, 50 lakh people are employed by, start, by tech, IT companies in India. So truly a remarkable transformation what they have done and given so much respect 
for the Indian economy, Indian capable software capability globally. And this is the this is the shoulder. These are the shoulders we build on top of as startup, as a startup ecosystem. And we're estimating by 2025 we will have at least one lakh startups. They will employ at least 3.25 million people. We would have been we would have seen at least 150 to 200 billion dollars invested in these startups. Hopefully we will beat China. We'll be number two. And most definitely we should try to get to at least 200 unicorns. We are at 82 today in 20, December 2021. So radical transformation, truly something impressive, something we should celebrate. And this year has been very interesting as well. So now this year we have seen $30 billion invested in Indian startups. This has been a record year for startups. As you know, you may have seen the news as almost every week there's a new unicorn. And not surprising today, in India, we have 82 unicorns that have created $250 billion in value. In fact, there, there are so many unicorns now, we, we, we couldn't even fit them all on the screen. And while, of course, Indian companies are building great, uh, Indian founders are building great companies in India, Indians globally are building tremendous value everywhere. We have four and a half, almost million people from India and the US, and they have built 67 unicorns in the US. Of course, thankfully, now we have more unicorns in India than we have Indians with unicorns in the US. But this is also a tremendous achievement that Indians, wherever they are in the world, are truly being an important part of this transformation. So when I say India is now a top three, this is now 82. There are 850 unicorns globally. 430 of them are in the US. 150 are in China. We are now 82. We should get to 100 hopefully very soon. So really now the race is not with UK, France, all of those countries are behind us. Now it's about how soon can we be number two? And this is a very important uh, race that India will be fighting this decade. So this value creation has happened at an unprecedented pace. Really no one would have even dared to predict that 2021 would have been this powerful for the startup ecosystem. But of course, it's created many very interesting companies and now we should see an acceleration of this kind of value creation going forward. And of course, now the world's investors are investing in India. You will see US in funds, you will see Japanese funds, you will see uh, Indian funds like us at 314, you will see you know, Singapore investors. So you will see all types of investors investing in India now because the opportunity here is truly remarkable. And India is a very open place for global capital to invest. So what does the future of these startups look like now? Now it's inevitable, but this is something that we must celebrate. Every aspect of the Indian eco economy is now seeing internet and startups helping them become more productive. Whether it is retail, Kirana stores, loans, uh, women-focused organizations, bus drivers, auto drivers, train conductors, every single life, every single aspect of life in India is now seeing technology truly help transform. And we must celebrate the fact that. For the first time, India, anywhere in the world, India has seen the government work with private industry to build truly a new type of public utility that did not exist anywhere else before. And when we say India stack, we mean the Jandan banking system plus the Aadhaar identity system plus, of course, all the policy that has gone into creating the mobile economy of India. So all these three things have come together to truly build a unique operating environment that all startups have benefited from, all people are benefiting from. And all of these very important digital platforms are helping us become more efficient as an economy, as a country. And that's why this decade, you saw that these are doing business in India has increased rapidly. We went from 142 to 63, and I hope it will be in the top 40 now in 2021. We have seen more taxpayers. We've seen more DBT enabled savings. We have seen UPI transaction volume grow in record numbers. We have 1.2 billion people, almost every Indian now on Aadhaar. So truly a remarkable transformation has happened even in the business backbone of the country. We're also now supporting very deep innovation companies. They're called deep tech, they, they patents, IP from biotechnology to robotics to IoT. We are seeing all types of innovation coming up in the country. And of course, these tech solutions are creating lakhs and lakhs of jobs from giving employment to blue collar workers, drivers, delivery boys, Ola cab operators, all the way to salespeople, to uh, you know, call center people, to all types of, all segments of the economy seeing absorption of jobs, absorption of people and improvement in wages because these startups are creating lakhs and lakhs of jobs every year. And 
thankfully finally we will go from a data poor country to a data rich nation by 2025 so all of these economic activity on top of digital is creating new forms of data that will make us more and more intelligent as an economy to be able to give better quality services to people to businesses to government and to build a very important loop of data that will keep us making sure that we stay on top of this and we continue to innovate and even the most fundamental means of the economy are changing very rapidly in india since the covid uh, pandemic broke the upi adoption in india has grown exponentially today we have 100 billion dollars in monthly upi transaction volume we started with almost zero back in 2017 so this remarkable growth over just four years something that even the most astute policy minds would not have predicted it's come because government has worked private industry has worked citizens have adopted the whole country has come together to make this to use this to make it successful to test it to many times it's broken we've fixed it but we keep improving it and that is something really important because if we didn't have a long term commitment to increasing upi and increasing inclusivity and access and reducing friction um, that race from 3 trillion to 10 trillion is going to be very very much more difficult so this all of this all of these pillars are adding up to becoming almost vital for that growth story that we need to build towards and many other areas of our daily life is also becoming more and more digital so our entertainment our gaming our media consumption our music preferences you see now a majority is tilting towards becoming more and more digital in the most important aspect of our life in health we've been through a difficult time through covid two waves but very clearly all of these startups from pharmacy to health to fitness to diagnostics telemedicine scheduling all of them have become more and more important uh, to our country to our citizens to our systems maybe the most interesting thing we saw this year is that if you look at all the technology in the world over the last 100 years and you measure how long it took for that technology to get to 50 million users 50 million is an important milestone for any technology it took airline 68 years to touch 50 million users it took electricity 46 years it took television 22 years the computer took 14 years internet took seven years facebook three years twitter two years pokemon go it's a video game 19 days aragya setu is the number one app in the world that is now gone from zero to 50 million users in 13 days extraordinary and aragya setu is not a company it is a public private partnership so even if you have skepticism that our startups creating value for us really or it's just all valuation and they're playing games with money no these companies these are all volunteers who came together to build for the country and the aroke setu app was built by real startup engineers from different companies coming together and in less than a month they built this full platform and in 13 days it went to 50 million users so incredible and and we should be very proud of the story and the fact that we can come together so quickly build technology and touch every life in india hopefully and of course, startups are not the only ones making all this innovation happen. So we are seeing, of course, the largest companies in India are now attempting to become tech conglomerates. And this is very good because I showed you that graph, right, of all those companies that are replaced by tech companies. We should make sure that India has a very different path, that all our companies adopt technology, all of them become more embracing, more welcoming to innovation. And of course, this Reliance Geo story, what a, what a terrific uh, story last year, the best investors in the world, it should be a very important case study for how large companies, a mainstream of India, evolves and embraces technology. Now, when I mentioned that liquidity is growing in the world, and I mentioned that also that liquidity will get allocated uh, to markets, no surprise, every fund that is active in India has now raised large money to increase its allocation to venture capital, including us. And of course, now that we have so many unicorns, it's come because so many more companies in India are able to establish their product market fit, are able to show they're creating large value for their respective verticals. And we expect that this unicorn creation will continue to keep its pace for next year as well. Uh, of course, many, many fantastic companies, terrific founding teams being added to this list every week. And we are now seeing that this average time to become a unicorn, it's becoming more, much, much shorter. It's becoming much more efficient. And this is an important piece for India. It's a big change in India because even three years back, we didn't have the kind of capital available to our best companies from India. Still, the best 
the top investors in India, the most money in our startups is coming from outside. So one very important challenge we need to address is how does Indian capital support Indian entrepreneurship? If, if all of our companies are raising money from outside India more than inside India itself, eventually the value is being created for money from outside India. And a lot of value is being created. Look at Baiju, it's up almost 400x, Swiggy is up almost 800x. This, these are fantastic returns. But a majority of these companies are all today owned by foreign capital. This is something that all of us in the industry, all of us outside the industry as well, must, must think about, must, must, must find solutions for. But of course, with or without Indian capital, Indian innovation will not stop. So we have, must figure out how to be a part of this story. Then valuation, value creation continues. We now have, Flipkart is now valued at close to 40 billion. Walmart bought it at around 20 billion. So they've doubled for Walmart, which is fantastic news. And we have many companies now crossing the 5 billion mark. All of them will be trying for an IPO soon. Many of them will get acquired by larger companies maybe. So absolutely an incredible story for how quickly Indian startups have become mature. And we have to ask ourselves, is this an extraordinary year? Absolutely. We had 42 unicorns, 41 unicorns created already. I'm sure we'll end the year with at least three, four more. This very significant jump, you look at every year, how you created unicorns. Really, the, the acceleration started from 2018, right? But it was very linear acceleration until 2021. Now, can we do better than this? We don't know. Will it go down? There's a good chance. But the fact that we created so many this year and the whole thinking about startups has changed this year. That is a remarkable achievement. And if we project this going forward, today our startups all put together are valued at around 400 billion, like we said. By 2025, can this go, grow at least two and a half X? Certainly. And again, you can see that many more unicorns can be created. Many more sunicorns will be created. Many companies go IPO and that value will be realized for the public markets. This value creation is not stopping. And if we are 1 trillion startup economy in 2025, and India's economy is around 5 trillion, say, we are 20% of the Indian GDP. No industry in India can claim to be 20% of the GDP, but the startup ecosystem will be. So truly, it's a remarkable transformation. It's an unbelievable story today, but it is an unbelievable story even five years back. Every five-year period, we're seeing that Indian startups are defying expectations. And we must not question them anymore. We must ask, how can we be a part of it? How can we make it more efficient? How can we democratize the value creation? How can we make sure that after all of this value creation is done, the money is reinvested back. It, it includes more people. Can we create more jobs? Can we improve wages? Can we improve the ecosystem for non-tier one innovation? Can we have non-IIT students start companies? So we must always think about escalating, improving, expanding, not restricting, not controlling, not putting it down. That has been the story for the last decade, but this decade we must think more expansively. And again, we must say that with or without any one person doing this, this ecosystem has to grow. So it's about collectively being a part of it, collectively making sure that we improve the likelihoods, improve the odds of this value creation happening. So a robust foundation has been laid to allow innovative solutions to solve India's hardest problems. And we need policy, we need market making, we need public goods like India stack, Aadhaar, we need, of course, the regulators blessings, we need public to consume, we need innovation to happen, we need our best engineers to stay in India, we need universities to work and help our students become market ready, become employment ready faster. But all of these things coming together means this will happen in a much more coordinated, much more beneficial manner. And that's something that again, uh, we are not fully solved, but all of us must aspire to be a small part of these solutions in different pillars of the Indian economy. So I'll conclude by saying that this is certainly an exceptional decade. And if you look at the startup ecosystem as an outlier, the definition was that exceptional Indians will work on innovative ideas to sustainably build and maintain rapid growth. But today startups are no longer outliers. They're part of the mainstream. They've been embraced by the Indian economy. They've been embraced by Indian citizens. So now we must say startups are going to help rebuild India for all Indians' perpetual prosperity. And that is our hope. That is why we do what we do. We hope to be a small part of this. But uh, if we are able to con uh, contribute, if we are able to continue helping our companies perform, we are able to create jobs, improve wealth, 
and democratize it, hopefully we believe that the country's path towards perpetual prosperity is that much closer to realization. So with that, I'll conclude this, this presentation. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, if we have time for questions, I'm very happy to answer them. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Pranav Pai. All the participants, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, post your questions in the chat box. So the first question is uh, from uh, Mr. Bikram Sil. He's asking the sectors and the industries you, uh, that is uh, 314 Capital invests in. Yes, of course. Uh, so we invest in five key, key areas, direct to consumer, FinTech, SaaS and enterprise automation, deep technology or IP, and digital media. Uh, we've seen across these five sectors, we are seeing the interface of different business models. For example, digital health, education technology, mobility, uh, communication. Uh, and we see that even though we have five areas, we see a lot of these areas coming into each other to become new business models. So we have, for example, digital media and education coming together to make education infotainment, for example, which is an interesting new category. So we see a lot of very interesting innovations in the business model, but we try to be focused on these five broad areas. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Alkish Mehta. Are the valuations justified without earnings be being realized? Yeah, it's a tough question to answer because everyone has a different view of valuation. Uh, I will spare you my lecture on valuation, but I will tell you that my observation is that when an, when an investor is willing to pay a certain valuation to enter that company, the share price, um, let us be very clear. These are some of the most sophisticated investors in the world. Um, they employ very highly qualified people. And my experience is that they know exactly why they are paying what they're paying. So whether it works out or not, whether a company is successful or not, that is a risk every investor is taking, but they are not paying these valuations without good reason. So whether we like it or not, whether I like it or not, whether you like it or not, Flipkart is going to be valued at 40 billion. Nike will be valued at 10 billion. This, those companies are going to get that valuation with or without you or me. That's the inevitable reality. So I try not to second guess these valuations. I try to understand what the rationales are. And I hope that, you know, we are making sure that we are improving the odds of success. Okay. The next question is from Mr. Aditya Kanda. Uh, what do you feel about the wellness industry primarily D2C like Mosaic or Ozevia? Yeah, so I, I fundamentally think that the opportunity for Indian brands uh, to build specific products for the Indian consumer across categories from personal health to wellness to fitness to food, um, nutrition, so on and so forth. Uh, we have seen absolutely terrific innovation across categories. You've seen Licious, Mama Earth, you know, brand new brands, for example, becoming billion dollar companies. Uh, we will see, of course, new companies like Oziva and so on uh, try. Uh, so we think D2C is a huge area. We have been small participants. We've had some success with our initial investments. Uh, certainly very large space. We think it will keep growing. Okay. So the next question is from Anjali Kumari. When to invest in digital market and when is the great time to invest in those money? Well, uh, uh, you know, we have a strange problem in India. We have all this innovation happening, but it's all private camp companies. Until this year, we didn't have many startups going IPO. It's a problem, right? So you know, there's an interesting observation we made in the US, for example, which is obviously the world's most valuable economy, the, also the most valuable startup ecosystem. They have made the, the process from startup to IPO very simple. And in the US, for example, if you if you are a young person, you're 18 years old, you're in college, uh, you get just you get your first bank account. You are using Facebook, you are using Instagram, you like WhatsApp, you like this company, you're using their product every day. You can use Facebook in the morning, you can buy Facebook stock in the afternoon. So any US citizen can vote for the products and companies they like. You like the Apple phone, you buy Apple stock. 
you like DoorDash for food delivery, you buy the DoorDash stock. You like using Uber, you can buy the Uber stock. But in India, if you look at our tech companies, we had TCS, Infosys, Wipro, so on and so forth. You and I as citizens are not using Infosys, Wipro products, right? They are enterprise products. So we never had the chance to buy the stock of the companies that we liked using the products of in technology until recently. So that's why the Zomato IPO, the Nika IPO, these were such important IPOs because finally there's a cultural loop that's closed. Indian citizens can now be shareholders of the products and companies they like in everyday life, right? So my, that's a long answer. The short answer now is, you know, it's a great time to look at these IPOs. You should be careful about which companies you pick, read about them, study them, listen to the analysis, read the reports. Um, you know, the, the talk about you know, the, the TV, um, CNBC and, for, and all, for example, are talking about these talks every day. So that cultural loop is closing in India now. And every citizen can now participate in these IPOs, buy the stocks. So that's a great way to participate. Okay. The next question is from Mr. Sanjay Gupta. He's asking about the sustainability of startups as many are incurring losses. Yes, sir. So again, startups are built very differently from public companies. Once you are a public company, it is about earnings, it is about profit, it is about profit growth, it is about EPS. You know, the KPIs are very different to measure the efficiency of the growth of a public listed company. But in startups, what you are doing is you are not building a company to be public from day one. You are building a company to optimize for growth. So what you would have spent five years getting to in revenue, you have to get done in two years. So you have to build technology, you have to hire in advance, you have to market in advance, you have to build your brand. And many of these companies are competing with very large companies. So for example, if a new brand comes up like Oziva and so on, they're competing with Unilever, they're competing with, they're competing with Britannia, Johnson Johnson, they're, building, they're competing with very large companies. So startups have to balance a lot of things out. And it is very hard for them to be profitable initially. Not because they don't choose to, because they're optimizing for growth. So obviously a company has to one day be profitable. That is obviously the end objective. But if you start with that objective, then you will not grow like a startup. So there are always very important balancing acts to be built between growth and profitability. Thank you. Uh, next question is uh, from Mr. Sagar. What are the promising upcoming sectors in India? And another question is related uh, to this uh, same question. Uh, what sectors will gain from using the data they are generating? So certainly in India, we see three very promising large opportunities. One is the whole fintech opportunity in India. We have a unique fintech environment where because of Aadhaar, because of UPI, what are large, very profitable business models outside India are not available inside India. For example, Visa and MasterCard are multi hundred billion dollar businesses, fantastic profitable machines because they run the payment networks for the entire world. But in India, we have UPI, which is a free network. Meaning you and I don't, if I send money to say Sagar, Sagar is not paying money to UPI. I am not paying a fee to UPI. It is totally free. So, so the entire payment model, for example, in India is a very different type of opportunity compared to US or Canada or, or Australia or wherever else. That's why even Visa and MasterCard are, are you know, they, they're also talking publicly about how UPI is a different challenge. So, so FinTech in India is a very different type of industry. It's a very, the way to monetize is very different. And uh, that's why so many companies are doing lending, so many companies are doing data, so many companies are building new banks, so many build, companies are building insurance distribution. We have many different types of um, innovation happening on top of that sector. So I think fintech is a very unique opportunity. And uh, secondly, I think the biggest one would be SaaS. So because we have such fantastic large IT companies in India, and IT companies in India are strange because 90% of the revenue comes from outside India. If you diagnose this industry, Indian IT, it's an outlier in every way because no industry in the world, even the US, China, have become globally dominating industries without having a majority of their revenue coming from their home country first. So Amazon is the world's most valuable e-commerce company because for the longest time, a majority of its revenues came from the US. Same story for Facebook, same story for Google, same story for Microsoft. 
they were large companies in the US with US revenue before they became global companies. But Infosys, TCL, Wipro, look at their balance sheets, look at their analyst calls. 90% of the revenue still comes from outside India. They never had local revenue support. But they are still the largest in the world now. Like I said, the five out of the top 10, three out of the top five, right? So it's, it's really difficult to be successful uh, when you were starting out in 1989, when these companies were 20, 25 years back, very, very challenging for them. So the fact that they have become so successful means they have made so much innovation and they have really had to fight hard to become this big. It's a tremendous story. Now, the engineers and the people trained in IT are now starting SaaS companies. So Freshworks was a recent IPO in the US. It's a totally Indian startup, but has IPO'd in the US for many reasons. That is one example of now the many very fantastic technology SaaS products that India, Indians will be building, Indian companies will be building. And again, they will go global from day one. I mean, they are not waiting to become large companies in India. They will sell their technology globally. And that is a tremendous story again. We can't do it without that IT 30-year experience. Very important. But that is a kind of um, that's a kind of opportunity these SaaS companies are tapping into. So I can keep on and on, but fintech SaaS certainly very big areas to monitor. Thank you. And uh, the next question is, what is the ideal check size for D2C startup in seed stage and what is your exit strategy? Uh, this is from Bikram Sir. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try not to speak about 314 specifics because a lot of this is confidential information, but typically okay. startups are raising between uh, three crores and 20 crores in the early stage. So depending on the brand, depending on the product itself, the startup costs are very different to manufacturing, for research, for design, for marketing, for retail, for distribution. So typically we're seeing between three and 20 crores is the range. Next question is from Mr. Sanjay Gupta. Are startup actually getting financial support from G uh, government of India? If yes, which are these government institutes? What is the role of uh, 314 Capital in boosting startups? Well, the answer is not uniformly, no. Um, there have been a lot of challenges for startups in India. Um, and not because the government is creating challenges, but because the startups are genuinely a little bit further ahead. That's the that's a job description. They have to innovate. So for example, crypto in India, we, we are still waiting for the regulation to come, but we have so many large companies innovating on blockchain and so on and so forth. Um, ideally, you would have the order would be regulation and then innovation, but everywhere in the world, not just India, innovation tends to be ahead of regulation always. That's a strange thing about innovation. So, so you know, it's a difficult question to answer. Uh, what can the government do more of? It is already doing a lot of consultations. The regulators are very eager to help remove friction. For example, SEBI did a fantastic job with the IPO regulation and you can see the result. This has been a record year for IPOs. So when government participates and it attempts to improve, fantastic things can happen. So we hope um, more friction is removed. There are a lot of things that are still problematic, but they are being addressed in different ways from data privacy and, and data localization to, for example, we banned Chinese apps last year. That was a big decision that was important for the country. So data security and so on. So a lot of lot of different issues, which uh, I you know, obviously cannot comment on all of them in one answer, but I'm happy to say that progress is being made every day. So we are hopeful, hopeful we are optimistic. Certainly we are doing our part to participate in these consultations and help improve the interface between uh, policy and, and, and startups. And the last question is from Mr. Sagar again. Uh, any areas of concern or trends which are disturbing? Well, uh, yes. So, so I'll answer that with an example. Um, in 2020, what happened with COVID early 2021 in India with the second wave? COVID was a uniform acid test of every business model, every investor, every market, every industry globally. It is really a black swan event in that sense because not too many macro events disturb everything at once. Right? Everything is shut down. That, that, that doesn't have, hasn't happened to me times before. Uh, global wars and so on caused that, but even World War II to shut down everything. Right? So this, this 2020 experience, um, when COVID hit, if you remember in the media, all the publications unanimously, very strange, but without thinking about it, without evaluation, without questioning their bias, 
they all said startups are over indian startups will die all these companies are going to crash all these billion dollar companies their valuations make no sense they don't deserve the valuation they will die the jobs will go, get lost the investors will lose money the indian startup, startup story is over so our default assumption from the media was negative right? very comical because you know these are not foolish people like i said before these are really smart people who are trying really hard to build extraordinary extraordinary ideas into reality and for that almost uniform dismissal was very strange for all of us to see right? what evidence are you using where is the grounding for any of this what happened as a result what do we actually see in reality almost every startup that was large made it came through even when companies like ola and for example as a company you know with ride sharing people are not going around the city there is no ride sharing revenue right even they have managed to come back in fact now they are in a totally different avatar with electric and so on and so forth right and they have raised billions of dollars which is very hard to do by the way it's not easy so even when startups were really badly hit they were resilient they held together and they came out of this crisis even stronger and all those obituaries that were being written were totally wrong so the mainstream media as an example has persistently been questioning judging condescending but reality doesn't agree with them and startups in irrespective of whatever they say startups will do their best to survive and stay resilient so it's an important lesson for all of us when you ask this question what are the areas of concern there are a lot of concerns there are concerns every day right they may there may be no capital next year there may be a full crash there may be a wave five of some other new variant of this virus who knows we cannot predict the future but startups are ready they are resilient they are smart people and i am very confident that even if they lose some we will lose some company that's fine that's the nature of innovation but the ecosystem will survive and they will come through even stronger so i think whatever concern we may have i am very confident i am optimistic that the startups are truly extraordinary companies truly extraordinary people they will figure out a way to succeed so uh, nothing particular to share but i hope that case study makes all of us understand what is happening in reality and we must all be aware that something truly extraordinary is going on underneath the underneath all of the judgment and bias thank you uh, mr pai thank you so much uh, for this wonderful session uh, i hope there are no uh, any further questions from the audience yeah so this was the last uh, question and uh, thank you for taking us through different points starting with uh, the k ship recovery to how india fare against emerging and developed nations to indian startup ecosystem to startups at a glance with 82 plus unicorns having 250 billion in value and uh, indians who are creating unicorns uh, globally steady transition to a no cash future the new normal indian tech company and lastly the robust foundation to enable innovative solutions to india's hard problems thank you so much and uh, i'm glad everyone enjoyed uh, the session we, uh, we look forward to have session more sessions with you mr pai thank you appreciate it thank you thank you so thank much you. bye good evening and uh, have a nice evening everyone thank you